this is actually the session I was really looking forward to because our discussion panel is pretty straightforward. We talk about supply chains and the threats to supply chains, and yet it has so many layers. It's not only about trade wars and a fragmentation of multilateralism, it's also about changing consumer preference, but also technologies mm -hmm. such as 3D printing. John, let me start off with you. How do you see the world economy changing given the trade tensions and trade wars? To be honest, I think it's a little early to really tell. So I think amongst the customers, the people that we were engaging with, the, the rough rule of thumb at the moment is a 10% tariff shock to the system is something that the system can deal with. There's enough margin in, cur in current supply chains, enough flexibility through exchange rates, um, and enough capacity for consumers to pick up a bit of the flex that a, a 10% shock to the system is something that's digestible and therefore won't really cause a, a shift. 25% is a different order of magnitude, and I think there's a sense that we don't really know what the impact of that is, is, is going to be. The reality, of course, is that certainly in manufacturing, in the short term, supply chains are reasonably fixed. Mm -hmm. um, so in the short term, not a, not a, not a great deal is, is going to happen. We've been surveying our customers. Um, you will have seen our Navigator survey that we released um, last week. And 8,500 customers surveyed um, they're still pretty optimistic about the outlook, and they will determine actually what the economic impact is. They're detecting the rise in protectionism um, across governments. Interestingly, though, what they're playing back is that could be a good thing, a catalyst for intra-regional trade. You know, the the US-China trade corridor is important, but there's an awful lot beyond, beyond that. And, as, and I think, as, as you mentioned, Francine, in your, in your opening remarks, there are two or three other big factors that will determine actually how trade um, is constructed over the next few years, not just um, protectionism or tariffs. <coughs> Demands of the Asian consumer are reshaping trade supplies. Sustainability, you know, 80% of, of a corporate's uh, carbon footprint exists in its supply chain. Um, and people are increasingly aware of that. A third of the customers that we survey plan to make adjustments to their supply chain over the next three years in response to the sustainability issues. And then the final thing, obviously, technology. Technology has the, the potential, actually, to, to unlock uh, um, and remove frictions in trade. So protectionism is one thing. Short term, I think, too early to, to tell. Customers, thankfully, I think, on the whole, remain reasonably resilient and reasonably upbeat. Marjorie, you're chair of a huge group. You make some 110 million t-shirts or shirts <laughs> a year. And you're telling me 50% are made in China. Talk to me about your supply chain and what you worry about it. Well, our company starts from uh, spinning the yarn and then making the fabric and then sewing. And because of our industry used to be under quota, so we've always had a geographical uh, distribution of the final assembly of the product. So we're very lucky in the respect that we still make all our fabric in China and then we've just moved the US order of the shirts to overseas factories and focused our Chinese factories on servicing the um, local market or Japan or EU. So we've been very lucky in that respect. M Mike, do you think a lot of companies are actually rethinking their supply chain because of trade tension? So they may not enact it, but they're thinking about it. Well, I think everybody is watching very closely what's happening. To John's point, you know, a shock to the system will cause shifts in the supply chain. I, for us in 3M, we have, you know, we have a model that's unique to us. We, we innovate with our customers uh, around the world, and as a result of that innovation you know, for those unique customers, we bring the supply chain close. We, we want to have our supply chain, our manufacturing operations close to our customers. So we have more than 250 manufacturing facilities around the world you know, local for our customers locally. So we have a supply chain that is flexible to a degree. You know, if you get to a bigger shock where the supply chain shifts dramatically, the capacity might not be there to supply, especially if, if where goods are produced changes uh, dramatically. And, and we provide solutions into healthcare uh, businesses. We provide solutions into automotive industry, into electronics. So if those supply chains shift around, that's probably the bigger shock for us. We have local capability to respond locally uh, but limited capacity for a big shock to the system. But I, you know, what we've seen so far, we haven't seen 
it necessarily shifting the production of our customers, and therefore our supply chains are well positioned, I, I think, with with at least for the, the, the shifts that we've seen to this point. Uh, John, is globalization really going into reverse, or is it just noise at the moment? No, I, I, I don't think it's going into reverse. I think this is a speed bump, and actually I think this is quite a long speed bump because it started, the anti-globalization speed bump started with the financial crisis 10 years ago. When we first started to understand that globalization through the financial system meant that risk was being dispersed into the system in ways we didn't understand, and when we did understand it, we really didn't like the consequences. We've had 10 years of repair and restructure, um, and now we're kind of transitioning into the, into the, the next chapter of that conversation, um, which is the real economy impact, and, and it's being manif it's manifest itself through, through trade and trade tensions. You know, I think there's a, there's a human dynamic at play here. Most healthy human beings, when they, they, do, they do a bunch of stuff, if they get it mostly right, they'll tend to think and worry about the things that are not going well. Globalization has been a force for good. It's 80% good. It's been 20% not so good. And I think we're just having this period of reflection now where we're forcing ourselves to confront some of the things that haven't worked out as well as they should have. We've got some wrinkles to work through, but I do not believe for a moment that globalization is going into reverse. One, one um, observation just to put out there. It's curious to me that when people go into, into voting booths, they are voting to harden national boundaries and to erect barriers. But the way that they live their lives, the way that they consume goods, the way they interact socially, is completely the opposite to that. They want to be connected. Now, we are, we're in 66 countries. We exist to connect customers to opportunities. And um, the demand for the international aspect of what we do um, continues to grow. And I, I can't explain it, but it, it's, it's the, the, the political behavior versus the social and the commercial behavior diametrically opposed at the moment. So I think globalization for me is still very much, um, very much a force for good and in good shape. And Marjorie, you were saying, of course, how your supply chain is reliant on China. Many of the world's supply chains go through China. Is there really an alternative? Um, yes. I think there are many alternatives. Um, for example, we've been thinking about uh, bringing so there's a lot of technology change, technological changes. In the past, we rely a lot on economy of scale. That's why you have huge factories. And then, final, we ship to, let's say, the US. But as the technology changes, um, fabric mills are becoming smaller and smaller, so they can be attached to a sewing operation. A sewing operation now, we were talking a lot earlier today about automation. I'd like to come back to that, but theoretically, I'd like to put the sewing operation as close to the consumer as possible to reduce the error of um, uh, what order to make. Yeah. So, but the, the problem there is, it's not the technology. It's the interface between the worker and the technology. Robots are cheap to buy, but to have a generation of managers and technicians who are able to leverage on technology, that takes time. And I'm hoping that this trade war or whatever disruption will wake up government to pay more attention to uh, vocational training because there's a breakdown in the human supply chain. So. If in China, they have a university that used to be called the China University of Textiles, gave up that name with the word China in it because it doesn't want to be associated with the textile industry. Hmm. Now, that is a symptom, I think, that is going around the whole world, but has to be changed because unless there are these um, middle managers and technicians, the productivity of the workers will not be coming up, even with automation. Because automation requires a higher level of management of technical capability to service it, then allowing the worker to benefit from it. But um, Marjorie, on, on restructuring the supply chain, does it mean that your costs would automatically go up? And who would pay for it? Is it your margins or is it the consumer? Well, 
if, if I have my way in our, my company, I can't speak for general. I'm using this trade war as a shock effect to get people to change the old. We've been trying to make people change the way we manage. It's such inertia, and I, I'm sure your companies are different. But <laughs> finally, I, I've got this opportunity, this trade war. Everybody is scared. Mm. That's great, because that will allow us to make a lot of the changes. That will bring, that will bring the cost down, because we will be able to make a better, more stable product, less wastage, uh, less quality issues. So those should um, equate, yeah. balance some of the cost, uh, 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 additional cost. Mike, what about you? Yeah, if you look at uh, what I was talking about earlier, if, as trade wars or, or changes in trade impact demand in a local market, that's what we would see, and that's when we would react. And, and I would say, you know, China and the U.S. In, today, we're investing in both of them. You know, largest part of our capital investment is for growth. It's to add new assets to support the growth in those local markets. Uh, China is an example. We we don't export much from China. Uh, it, it's investment in capacity in China for China. We actually import into China, uh, some of that from the U.S., but more from other places around the world. So there's a little bit of flex in the supply chain for China. We could continue to invest more, and we are. It's, with the growth that we've seen in China, it's, it's in some ways hard to invest enough to, to get ahead of that. But majority of what we sell in China, we manufacture in China today. And, but there's room to invest more, even as you know, the economy flexes or changes or trade impacts it. Uh, for us, it's really when our customers shift their supply chains. So our global customers, as they change where they demand our products, then we would react to that. And that typically would mean investing as opposed to restructuring. We would have to invest to meet the capacity someplace else. It might put challenges into utilization in places they're shifting out of. Yep. Uh, and that would you know, eventually manage restructuring. But again, it's, uh, the, the distributed nature of our supply chains gives us a little bit of resilience there. And, and so I, I think it's, at this point, it's a shifting in investments as opposed to restructuring. But Mike, what if you had to bring back some of the supply chain in America yep. even more? A, would that be feasible? And two, what would that mean for costs? And what would it mean for the new economy? Yeah, so we, to set the stage, I mean, we're a net exporter out of the U.S. today. And, and so we, we produce most of what we sell in the U.S. in the U.S. We export some from the U.S. because of the nature of kind of the scale of some of our supply chains. But, uh, you know, we are not importing from outside the U.S. much of, of what we sell in the U.S. The majority of the, the large majority of it's produced in the U.S. So it, we haven't shifted to alternative sources of supplies to shift back in the U.S. So it's really a local for local. So there, there's always, because of the nature of which capabilities you have in which country you share some of that, but it's not a strategy of of moving significant portions of your supply chain outside of a region and then re-importing back into it. So we don't have to face into that. It's really a shifting around your customer demand. Yeah. I think just, just to add something, I think if, if it is the case that supply chains do come home, if manufacturing does relocate back into the, into the West or the developed economies, it's unlikely that jobs go with it. It's likely that the manufacturing is automated. Automation. So. Um, the, the kind of the hope that we can take and transfer jobs back from the developing world back into the developed world, I, I think actually is, is a stretch. I don't think that'll be the case. Well, I think that I'd like to follow up on that point. The key is um, education. I think all the countries need to uh, look at education. Um, MIT has a new initiative called um, Work of Future, and then looking at how People should be prepared for the new jobs, which should be better jobs. Um, that is critical. Having uh, trade tariffs, et cetera, to promote manufacturing in this place. We have an operation in Mauritius. And as John knows, uh, <laughs> it has no business being there. It is so far away from the customers. But because of the tariff benefits, we're there. Now, actually, in a way, it's quite awkward because we have 5,000 workers there. It's a major, so we end up being a major employer. I can't get 
out of there. I can't, that would disrupt the local economy. But supposing the trade benefits are removed. Now, these trade-induced uh, investments are not good for countries. It is extremely unstable. And so I'm hoping that countries will really look at the education system, the entire human uh, resource value chain, rather than looking at just focusing on short-term trade tariff benefits. And I want to ask you in a second how many workers you have. But John, first a question to you on China. Mm -hmm. So yesterday we were all listening to President Xi opening the China International Import Expo. He talked up his commitment to, to free trade. But how painful for China and therefore the rest of the economy and the markets will be that transition from exporter to importer for China? Well, I'm, I'm, not I'm not sure that's the transition that we're, that's in front of us. And we've got the transition from... Um, from an export-led economy, I guess, to a, an internally consumption-led economy. And I think um, that's progressing reasonably well. I mean, the Chinese retail market overtook the U.S. retail market. The biggest retail market in the world now is, is China, uh, su surpassed the U.S. this year in September. Um, so I think that that transition is, is happening reasonably well. Um, in, uh, as we've heard, I think a lot of um, government ministers in China express there are some challenges in the, in the domestic system right now. It's not just the US-China trade corridor. They've got some deleveraging that they're dealing with as well. Um, but to date, their track record in meeting these challenges is, is good. So I, again, I, I don't, I'm reasonably sanguine about that transition period. Mm -hmm. And the, direct, the, the direction of travel here is, is beyond doubt. China will be the biggest economy in the world in the not too distant future. Um, and it has a number of advantages that, that the West actually candidly doesn't enjoy right now. So I still remain very optimistic. Uh, Marjorie, you have an enormous amount of workers working for you. How will robotics, but also 3D, change um, your industry? Oh, um, it should make the industry much greener because right now the industry, this industry, relies too much on people. Um, so. If there's, we have a lot of process that are unstable. We know we can make the process more stable so that the quality will be better. There's a lot, of, but then it's inertia that's getting in the way of um, a new generation of young people that need to replace the older mentality, etc. So this is, I think, um, with all this chaos, I think we can look forward to hopefully, if we play it right, a greener supply chain mm -hmm. um, and um, more stable, I, I hope, more stable process in, uh, for example, I mean, in China, when you asked about import, that's good, more competition. The uh, one problem, I just came from Beijing, from um, uh, sustainability development advisory, under the State Council. The big concern there is consumption is much more difficult to um, maintain green. Because once everything is distributed, it's very difficult to say recycle. Um, poly bag that people take home, it's very difficult to bring back. The packaging that's happening right now, a lot of new challenges. And, and just as the government is trying to deal with the uh, um, the green um, manufacturing. Now it has a new challenge of the consumption market. So the, it poses a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. But how many workers do you have today across the world, and how many do you think you'll have in five years? Uh, 55,000 now. Um, we hope to have fewer people, but much higher pay. And I think that's the key. We have 25,000 people in one city outside of um, near Guangzhou, about three hours away from Hong Kong. So it's, we are one of two um, major employers. And we can see over the last 10 years, the income has gone up. So consumption, the small restaurants, because the workers are making more money, the small restaurants are able to have more than one seating. So immediately their income goes up. Mm -hmm. I can now get manicures. Um, we started off with only 
McDonald's. Oh, no, McDonald's wouldn't come, so only Kentucky Fried came because they said, you don't have the consumption capability. Now we have a um, McDonald's, and uh, Starbucks is almost there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, I think, uh, at least for China, so long as the income of the workforce, the employment, the quality of the employment goes up and the pay goes up, that's the key. I don't think it's exactly the number of people we employ in manufacturing. It spills out and affects, the multiply effect is very important. Uh, Mike, how is robotics and 3D changing your company and your industry? You know, it's one of those disruptive technologies that is really important to a manufacturer. It, it enables you to improve your quality, become more efficient. Uh, you know, if you look at our manufacturing operations, about a third of our intellectual property is in manufacturing, in process technology, trade secrets often. And, and this is, you know, so it's part of our DNA to continue to look to innovate manufacturing. So disruptive technologies, 3D printing, robotics, broad range of automation, those technologies are enabling us to do things that we weren't able to do before, uh, reach performance and quality levels, you know, even new heights that, that we can take them to. And so there's also an efficiency gain. So it, it impacts a given operation. You might have fewer workers in a given operation. And, but that's been a journey, I would say, for us you know, over generations. We've automated and, and changed our production capacity or capabilities to where it's become less people intensive. But at the same time, our the number of people we have in manufacturing operations around the world has been remarkably stable, slightly increasing, partly because of that growth. We're investing in capacity around the world to meet growth. So as you grow, we're growing jobs, not at, you know, not at the same rate we grow maybe our sales, but still growing jobs and using technology to really innovate in our manufacturing. But so to Marjorie's point, does a trade war, t trade tensions actually just you know, accelerate the shakeout of the supply chains? Well, I think it, it, as you think about responding to what we were talking about earlier, that you'd have a shift in your supply chain, a shift in demand, you can certainly use technology to extend your capacity. And that's been one of the things that has been beneficial. You don't have to invest in entirely new manufacturing operations. You know, we've been a company that's been focused on process improvement. So for a couple of decades, we've used Lean Six Sigma to extend the capacity of our, of our operations. Now technology is the lead disruptor there. You can extend the capacity of your, of your current operations. That can be helpful and it's probably puts a, will accelerate our investment. As we came into this year, we actually increased our investment in disruptive technology because we saw that opportunity. It, it, it wasn't responding to trade wars, it was responding to a, a higher return for adding capacity. Yeah, I have to defend technology. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of um, people only talk about the threat of technology, but in our case, we see de-skill, so a lot of the automation helps the worker. One very simple example, you know, in the garment industry, they used to have written instructions. These are people who are not that literate. Now, you can have videos, you can have audio, it helps the worker. Secondly, before, uh, workers were not able to, uh, your education sort of gets you stuck. You are not able to, um, if you don't know, they used to joke about 45-year-old women, well, I'm older than that, but if they don't have a technology background, you can't teach them technology. Hmm. We have been using a way that was developed at MIT that teaches children to code. So I go to a, a worker and say, have you been bullied by your children who wave their mobile phone at you and say, Mom, you are obsolete? Uh, if you can tell them you've built an app that will restore your position. So we use that to tell the worker, you are not going to be lunch for technology. You can leverage on technology. Then we move them on to use technology. So there's a lot. Technology can also help workers educate them, um, make their work more stable. So I think overall technology is good stuff. I mean, what Marjorie's talking about is basically displacement, right? What are the unintended consequences for these changing supply chains for certain new economies? 
Well, I think the, the, the <laughs> first point that Margie touched on relates to the future of the workforce, and that, that's a, a big debate. We, could, we, could, we don't have enough time to get into that. My reflection listening to, to Margie speak about how her workforce would change over time, I would have given exactly the same answer two completely different industries, mm. but for financial services, I would have said the same thing. Over time, the number of people we will need should reduce, but the quality of the jobs and the skills required will go up, and, and therefore, yep. it may, may not end up costing us less. I think um, I, I, would, I would give that answer now. I would have given the answer five years ago, yeah. um, and remarkably, employment across most of the world remains in very, very good shape. Labor markets are reasonably tight, so this, this you know, we're, we're anticipating a cliff edge with respect to employment that's driven by technology, and I think it's right for us to be concerned about it, but it is not happening yet. Um, we're almost running out of time. So, Mike, what is your priority, or what are you focusing on when you look at your supply chain over the next three years? Well, I, I would say the, the big change is disruptive technology. It's, it's really an enabler of new capabilities that you can that you can bring to the market. So I think it's it's Where do you find it in house? Or no, do you it's, buy a it, it's uh, like I said, we have about a third of our intellectual property in manufacturing. So we have a focus in our research and development on manufacturing processes. But there's an outside in view of that. We also, you know, we we have partners, we have uh, acquisitions, we learn from all of those as well. You've got to you've got to fight that uh, insularity that can come from being successful in a capability like manufacturing. You have to go outside, and I think that's, that's part of that disruption. Marjorie, what about you? What's your main focus for your supply chain in the next three years? Oh, learn to manage better, because in order to use more and more technology, we've got to strengthen our own ability to manage better. At the end of the day, that's even more important than technology. Thank you so much for a great panel. Thank you.